Welcome to Small Practice Support Information Session number 22. In this Law Society of Ireland recording, Bill Houlihan talks to Justin Purcell about recent Law Society changes to PII renewal. So you're all uh, very welcome uh, to the Small Practice Information Session 22, and we're uh, a real pleasure to be joined by uh, Bill Holohan uh, to discuss professional indemnity insurance renewal for 2020 and uh, some of the changes or recent changes made by the Law Society. So just to introduce Bill, he's a solicitor and uh, a recently appointed senior counsel. So we're, we're, we're delighted to have, have you uh, join us today. Um, Bill is a member of the Council of the Law Society of Ireland. He's vice chair of the Professional Indemnity Insurance Committee. So we'll be hearing from the horse's mouth. Uh, he's a husband, father, Irish solicitor, notary, uh, public mediator, dispute re resolver, insolvency practitioner, author, speaker, trademark agent, and has a, a deep history uh, interest in history. So uh, I think uh, I think uh, a real pleasure to have you, Bill. And nice to offer. Um, now, just in, again in context. I'm a solicitor in a, in a now three-person practice, and the board is really much larger. But there's now two, three solicitors in the practice with a uh, proportionate level of support staff as well. Um, so we have, uh, I'm coming at this from the point of view of the, the smaller practitioner in terms of my own practice experience, but I'm going to be talking about the, the experience generally. Uh, there's interesting statistics in the Law Society in annual report, which came out the other day in relation to uh, the number of practices and over half of the profession are involved in practices of one to four solicitors. So that's the kind of the, the emphasis on the approach. In terms of the PowerPoint, I'll go through this fairly quickly. Um, I have about 25 slides, and I'll get through them in about 15 to 20 minutes, just to give you the, the heads up. Can you see the uh, slides? Yeah. Okay. Bill, if you could speak closer to the uh, microphone a little bit, that'd be good as well. Yeah. yeah. Uh, now, this worked when Justin and myself were doing this earlier, uh, but trying to advance the slides for some last reason, it has now decided to be awkward. Um, sorry, just give me a second, let me start the slideshow again. Right, once more, feeling the KSC. Right, but the, the, the quick kind of the, the history. Um, the, the general insurance market has been toughening up in recent years. That's not just professional indemnity related, it's general insurance as well. And the larger insurance companies have been taking a hammering. Now, when they do that, they try to recover premium income um, to, to make up for the claim for going out. They're also getting concerned again about professional indemnity because people are becoming more inventive in terms of the way that they're claiming. The value of claims has gone up. That means bigger payouts, which means they need bigger income pool to, to meet those. So all the predictions are that there's going to be a bumpy right ahead. So the question is, what can you do about it? The, the essence is uh, to, to be prepared, get your preparations ready early and make full disclosure of everything that you need to do when you're actually uh, putting together your proposal. So um, there has been a withdrawal from QBE from the market in the past year, but good news is that uh, there will be an announcement coming from the Law Society before the week is out in relation to uh, an expansion of the number of insurers coming into the market. And great credit has to be given to Sir Kays, who's the executive in the Law Society, who primarily deals with insurance companies on behalf of the Insurance Committee and the Law Society. And also, in fairness to the efforts of Finbar Jeffers from Malaria Insurances, who's also been lobbying through industry uh, sources to try and expand the pool of uh, insurers out there. Um, but that said, while we have a slight expansion in the pool of insurers this year, the insurance companies are becoming more selective about who they'll take and why. People need to understand that insurance companies have a perception of small practices. The majority of firms may be the, the one, two, three, four solicitor practices, but they're wary of those because they don't see them as having the same level of sophisticated procedures that the larger firms might be expected to have. The larger firms have the luxury that they can employ somebody uh, as a door opener in the morning and a door closer in the evening, or someone to look after the whole question of regulation of practice or the monitoring of people going uh, on, on a daily basis. The sole practitioner has a, a been there. I was that sole practitioner at one point uh, when I set up my own practice 22 years ago. You are perceived by the insurance companies as being a potential risk 
and they have an image of you, regardless of how good you are, regardless of how careful you are, regardless of how sophisticated your systems are. Um, sole practitioners are the primary sources of uh, the claims as far as they're concerned, because there's nobody to monitor what you're doing. At least if you have a partner and you're a two-person practice, the theory is that somebody else is monitoring you or keeping an eye on you uh, and keeping you up to speed. Um, so the more you can demonstrate that you have systems for these things, the better. The insurance companies, that's a quick talk of who's there. Um, when I was putting in the uh, last bit of it, the new insurer is a possibility. It was a possibility, but as I said, there'll be an announcement coming to the last night later in the week in relation to that. But different firms are becoming more selective. Our firm has been with AIG for a long number of years, but they're moving away from the smaller firms. Um, and some insurance companies as well are saying they'll only take people who have turnover of kind of 500,000 uh, plus per annum. So it, it, the actual pool is becoming smaller and smaller for the uh, smaller practices. The result is that there is going to be a bumpy ride ahead this year in terms of renewal. So you need to try and make your preparations as soon as possible. So a bit like the mouse space and the mouse, mouse trap, get girded to, to do battle. Um, so be prepared. Download the common proposal form if you haven't already done it. You can download it in PDF or there's a fillable version on the website. It's a very extensive form. Do not leave it until the last day of the month to start looking at this. You'll be daunted even if you haven't uh, looked at it already, if you look at this form and see the level of detail that needs to go in there. Now, there are insurers out there who are offering a short form. If you're going to complete it, send it to them and, and renew with them. <clears throat> That's fine uh, this year. But the problem is that eventually, whether it's in two, three or four years time, if you're renewing with the same insurance company, they're going to want the full palaver and they'll be looking for all the historical detail. So it's, it takes a bit of time, but it is worth the investment to go through the, the full form rather than the short form. The second problem with a short form uh, renewal with your existing insurer is it's your existing insurer. You need to check with your broker who they are going to be submitting the form to. And if there's a limited pool, you need to be submitting it to the others shopping around. You'd probably do it for your car insurance. Uh, there's no reason why you shouldn't do it for your professional dental insurance as well. It is going to take time, but this is probably the biggest single outlet for small practitioners in the course of the year. So it's worth the time to get ready and be able to, to shop around in good time. So start today. Um, and even if you get interrupted by the, the phone call uh, or some set of contracts that you have to vote this evening or whatever it is, um, if you chip away at it like, a bit like eating an elephant one bite at a time, you should be able to get it done in the next couple of days. But take it slowly and take it carefully. Uh, be conscious as well about your broker. Check out with your broker what kind of broker they are. Are they execution brokers or are they advisory brokers? Execution uh, brokers only submit the thing, they're a glorified post box in terms of submitting it on to an insurance company for you. Um, the advisory brokers will advise you on what's best uh, for you in terms of your firm profile, the type of work you're doing, what steps you can take to try and minimize the risk, what further information you could provide in terms of the proposal, uh, etc. And they'll spread it around uh, as much as possible. Uh, also check with your broker what fee they're going to be paid. Uh, they're getting a slice of premium that you're paying as their commission for the actual placement of, of the, uh, the work. So find out how much it's costing you uh, for your broker. And again, shop around. Now, as with anything, uh, you need to pay properly for good services, whether it's good legal services or good professional indemnity insurance services. Um, but the, the time to start is now. So make sure you've got a, a good strategy in place. Map out what system you have. Ideally, if you have a firm manual which documents how uh, things are, uh, are worked, if you have, for example, an electronic file management system, whether it's Expedia, Keyhouse, uh, Documatics, whatever uh, the system is, th legal thread, uh, make sure that you provide the detail. That's the system you use. Show that you've got alarms, you've got reminders, uh, you've got systems in place. Now, at the end of the day, the reason we have insurance is because everybody, everybody, everybody screws up at some point. Uh, 30 years ago, I remember Dermot Leeson giving a lecture saying that's the reason why we have insurance. A busy practitioner in the course of any given week will probably make, he said, about 100 mistakes. 10 of them uh, will have some minor significance, 90 of them will be completely inconsequential. And of the one out of the 100, something might actually be an annoyance. Uh, over far now, it was 40 years ago that I left uh, UCC and started my apprenticeship. 
And over those five years, I've had two claims in that period, and I consider myself lucky uh, that it's, it has only been two. There probably were other schools at various stages. We all do it. That's why we have it. The systems help us to avoid them, whether it's the uh, diaring and the scheduling to make sure that we issue proceedings in time, or that we don't miss a, a court date, or whatever it is. Uh, but the more you can show that you have systems and it's there to help you avoid making any kind of an error, the better off you are. It's particularly important in high risk areas of work, uh, such as conveyance and COVID, etc. So in terms of the proposal form, be prepared, as I say, to answer a lot of questions, provide all the materials and give full disclosure. Um, make sure that you give a, a good profile of your practice, exactly who's involved, the experience you have, how long you've been in practice, uh, the office systems that you operate the areas of practice that you're in. And as I say, again, you're going to be boxed. If you are in the higher areas, conveyancing, uh, probate, wills, estates, et cetera, like that, uh, that could kind of clocks up a, a higher risk profile and leads to a higher premium. Set out your claims experience. Uh, if you are able to say that in 40 years, you only had two claims, then that stands to your credit that over the years, you, you've been uh, trying to avoid uh, the risks that are involved. If you're operating remotely, as a lot of people are at the moment, you need to set up the systems that you have, particularly from a COVID point of view, because this is a factor that people are concerned about in terms of cybersecurity. Uh, there are more and more attacks coming on solicitors in terms of interception of emails and diversion of instructions uh, regarding transfer of funds. Um, you wouldn't, for example, share your client account details on an email. You might do it on WhatsApp to a client by some secured method, or you send it out in the post. But you've got to be conscious of those type of things. Talk to your broker about it. Look up the uh, cyber security stuff on the Law Society website and on the uh, pages related to professional benefit insurance as well. If you have a business plan, give the insurers that as well. That shows that you're thinking about the type of work that you're doing and how you're going to handle it uh, over the, the future. It may be a work of fiction, but it demonstrates then that you're thinking ahead. And the, the person who thinks ahead is a careful person and they're prepared to plan and they're not going to plan uh, to, to fail. In terms of claims, any claims that have cropped up in the course of the year should be disclosed and should be disclosed fairly early. So anything since the 1st of December should be disclosed to your current insurers. The problem is if you don't, you may not be able to go back to them if you change insurers because you haven't uh, made and notified the, the claim. In other words, a claim is made is someone making a claim against you, notifying it uh, is when you tell the insurers about it. Now, on the one hand, if somebody says, oh, you screwed up my case, I'm not paying fees because you made a debs out of it, um, do you report that? If there's any credible basis for a claim, you have to. The definition of uh, a circumstance is something capable of giving rise to a claim. Um, you wouldn't report every time a client uh, threatens to sue you because they're not paying your fees. That puts it in context, but you can't be criticized for doing it because if you show that you're that cautious, that you're disclosing everything, then uh, the insurers won't be concerned. However, they don't like laundry listing. Laundry listing is where you take out and you wash all your dirty linen just before the year end, as distinct from having got uh, a, a potential claim in from somebody in February and only telling them just before renewal. So if, if you build up a profile of reporting things promptly, if threats are made to sue you, then at least you've, you've notified it. Over the years, I've notified stuff where someone has threatened to sue me, but I said, look, I don't think this is a credible claim for the following reasons. And insurers have noted this uh, and said, yeah, we agree with you. We don't think this is going to go anywhere. Uh, but the fact that you're prepared to do that, that stood to my credit subsequently. Um, so disclose everything and do it promptly. The types of work that are uh, giving rise to claims, low risk, adjudication, arbitration, mediation, uh, agency work, children work, criminal expert witnesses, uh, reporting. Medium risk is defendant litigation of foreign patrimony personal injuries. The high risk is commercial litigation, uh, commercial property work, estate work, financial advice, intellectual property, probate, tax, estate planning, that kind of stuff. And very high is the commercial work, public and non-private companies and uh, conveyancing. And that's not my categorization, that's the insurance companies. So a couple of examples there are just given. I'm not going to uh, go through all of those. You can go back over the slides later. But it gives uh, an example of the type of things where claims might arise. Um, again, cybersecurity becoming more important. There was a push in recent years by the insurance companies to sell cyber cover. Um, some people pushed back against that. They suggested last year they have to have it. You don't have to have it, but it is uh, such a risk nowadays in reality that it, it's actually quite cheap to get it and it's better to, to include it. 
later on today, the Law Society Guide to Renewal in relation to insurance for 2020 will be coming up, and it gives tips for renewal, important points to note, greater detail than what I've been giving here today. today. If you don't get any quotes, if you are running into difficulty, and the, the question is, the law society can't force an insurer to give you a quotation, but if for whatever reason, your profile is such that an insurance company is not prepared to, to quote, or is not prepared to take a renewal uh, proposal from you this year, and you're left without any option, and you should identify that early, not on the uh, last day of the month, then you can apply to this special purpose fund manager. Uh, the name is now DWF Tins Ireland, applying to go into the assigned risks pool for cover. Now, this is a temporary one year holding cell before you either go back into the general insurance market or you're out of the, the market altogether. Um, it comes at a higher cost and with the more restricted cover than you'll get in the market. But it is really a last chance to cover for people. The Dublin Solicitors Bar Association Gazette came, or Parchment came out the other day. And it said that there were 57 firms in the pool last year. There weren't. There were only two. Um, so it, it is really the, the last chance to do for somebody. It gives them the breathing space in the course of the year to either uh, get things in order so that they can get covered in the market, or alternatively, they're going to have to make arrangements to close the practice, merge, or, or do something else. Um, if you're going to go into the ARP, uh, then really you should have been uh, building HULs as time machine to go back and apply 60 days beforehand, but sooner rather than later. You can apply on a provisional basis. If you think you are not going to be able to get insurance this year for one reason or another, you can apply uh, on a provisional basis, and it'll only kick in if you find that you're not able to get a quote in the market. Um, there is help there. You can phone the society in relation to it. Uh, you can send emails as well in looking for help uh, in relation to queries that you might have or um, any issues that you're, you want addressed. So uh, I set a timer for 20 odd minutes and we're uh, three minutes to go. So we've plenty of time for questions. Now, in the course of the uh, Twitter AFI iterings in the past day or two, there was um, some questions, there were some questions which came in. But before we finish the slideshow, I let Justin jump in just to do the commercials for next week's show. Okay, thanks, Bill. That, that's great. So, um, just maybe just to talk about next week, uh, just for a second, just to give you a rest there for a second. So, marketing plans and growth strategies with Clodo O'Brien from Crow, and then there's another session on this uh, professional indemnity insurance issue. Uh, frequently asked questions on funds with Aidan Leonard uh, from the Special Funds Manager, and after that, we're going to be talking to the Chambers of Commerce the following week, and then the week after, uh, buy, sell, and merge. So. So, Bill, are you ready to take some questions that we've uh, previously kind of prepared or, or that have been asked? So, yeah, sure. So, can the uh, Law Society stop insurers asking me about past claims, etc.? Marcel Marceau said in uh, Mel Brooks' The Silent Movie, no. Um, in, basically, this is a risk issue, and the insurance company wants to know how much of a risk you are. And the fact that you have had claims in the past, uh, they're going to ask about them because they'll want to know did you learn from it? Did you do something again? I mentioned that I had a claim. Now, the first one I had was when I was with the SMDF and uh, I got covered the following year in the market, cheaper than the SMDF as that happens. And when I queried, you know, are you not conscious of the fact that there was a claim last year? They said, well, you're never going to do that again, are you? Um, because we would learned from the lesson and we didn't put things in place. The, the market's not a high market in terms of premium value for the insurance companies. And it's historically, it's costing huge losses. So the law society isn't in a position to tell them, uh, given there's a limited number anyway, to say you must offer these kind of terms. It sets what level of cover must be provided, but not at what cost. It's a bit like saying to the insurance companies, uh, you know, or a bit like a solicitor uh, finding somebody coming in the door uh, as a client and say to them, look, I want you to do the following for me and you're going to have the following cost uh, to me. They're the fees. Um, and you're not going to ask me any awkward questions. Uh, I'm not going to give you all the relevant information that you think you want. That you wouldn't operate that way as a solicitor. Insurance companies don't operate that way either. So, just just a question from my own perspective. It, like, given the limited number of operators in this in the in the sector, it, is it worth shopping around, or is that just a waste of time? Or like, how, what's the best way of a small purchaser using it their time? To... The example the example I just gave you, where I was with the SMDF at one point, and the following year I shopped around. And I got a much cheaper quote, as it happens. Um, so yes, 
sometimes it won't make any difference, but you do it with your car insurance, do it with your professional limited. And did you use a broker to do that or did you approach them directly yourself? Both. Both. Uh, okay, so uh, another question. So what, what, what is an expected rate increase? What, what are you predicting that there's going to be or does it depend on? It, it's, it's anecdotal and it's going to vary across the board, but anywhere 20% uh, up would not be too surprising for the smaller practices. Now that's a shocking figure for some people, but that's the, the, the possible range. We don't know for certain because the insurance companies are going to be uh, quoting. But, um, you know, the, the, some people have got their quotes already and are on Valium as a result because of the, the jump in, in, in the, the premium levels. It's going to vary from firm to firm because of that particular profile. Okay, so we are taking questions. So if anybody wants to set in a question on the chat, we'll, we'll take them. So here's another question. Well, why can't the Law Society get more concessions from insurers for solicitors? Well, they, they can get some concessions to a certain extent. And as I said, the Law Society sets the minimum terms. But the problem is if you uh, make it too onerous on the insurers, you're going to drive insurers out of the market. And we have had insurers leaving the market over the years. So you've got the Law Society to try and strike a balance between a, a credible market terms on the one hand and uh, competition on the other by keeping as many insurers in the market as possible. So, uh, you know, this year, for example, there was a change so that the one-off cover was restricted again for six years, it was unlimited. Um, but the likelihood of any claim coming in after six years is remote in any event. Uh, so it, it very much depends on what's actually possible in any given year uh, as to what will dictate the terms. And, and, and what, what, what types of things have the Law Society been doing over the last kind of couple of months to make this process easier for people? Well, we, we had a, an insurance committee meeting uh, recently and it went on for over four hours during down to the details. So all the questions that are going to be asked in a 10 minute slot here have been asked and answered more, much more extensively over a dedicated four hour meeting uh, recently. On an ongoing basis, the, there's uh, an executive in the last uh, social Hayes who liaises with insurance companies. And I have to give great credit to her for the the Trojan work that she has done this year in massaging the insurance companies to keep them on site. Um, it, it, were it not for her work, it's possible even more insurers than QBE would have exited the market this year. Uh, and she has laid the groundwork for other insurers coming in. Yeah, so th this actually leads into another question. So what, what, can you name some of the executive brokers who might advise you or does this relate back to the renewal guide that you're talking about that will be related the renewal to the guide. All, the, all the brokers are listed in there. Okay, and that renewal guide is going to be issued out on the website later today, is it? Today, yeah. Uh, and maybe it, we, we can provide a link then when we're sharing the slides out uh, and the recording out to people. So there's a question there around the options with regards to premium finance. Is, are there options around financing this? There are, and again, if you log on to the, um, the, the website in relation to professional insurance, there's guidance in relation to the financing as well. Yeah. And question there, if a broker is shopping around for you, like, is there any point in going directly yourself or are you just and that's why i asked the question as i made the point earlier you need to ask the question of your broker who are they submitting it to now if they're doing the work for you and spreading it around to everybody you don't need to shop around but if uh somebody only deals with certain insurance companies then you need to consider the possibility of going to the others okay so another question there i'm not quite sure whether i understand the question but does the guide identify which ones are executive i'm not too sure what they mean by executive i'm not sure what they mean either yeah Executive brokers, is there such a thing? Oh, uh, yeah, oh, you mean that's, that's the difference between the, the people who are only going to be a glorified post box uh, or whatever. I know you, you need to ask your broker well, what are they doing? What, what category do they fall into? So, just to make that point again, the difference yeah, between an advisory, executive broker yeah. and an advisor broker, right. they're, they're different. Yeah. Okay. So, it's important that the, you'd be advising to go towards a more advisor broker. Uh, who would understand it better because you're getting more bang for your buck in terms of they they're getting paid a certain premium uh share so you need to find out what are they doing for it yeah so here's another question would a master policy not just be cheaper for everybody no again there's a if you want to mine into the history of it you can but essentially the, the problem with a master policy is that it's the profile of the least performing least effective least responsible least careful solicitor uh that taints the profile of everybody else. So you're brought down. It's not a question of having different categories or profiles in the way that it would operate in the market. So it actually works out as much dearer for everybody because everybody's reduced to the lowest common denominator in terms of standard. Okay. Uh, and then why, why, why were changes made to the runoff uh, cover to limit it to just six years? 
support. I, again, it was a, a simple enough concession from the last night we gave. It was a request from the insurers it, it up to this year. It was now it had been six years previously. Then it went to unlimited. It's now back to six years again. It's just one of these kind of harsh trades in terms of keeping people happy and being seen to give them something that in reality doesn't amount to much because claims will be made usually within six years anyway. And it's run off cover. If somebody feels that someone's gone out of business, they're not going to start chasing them in practice. Uh, and even then, uh, if they do, they're stuck with a six year contractual uh, basis or, or negligent basis and move on. Okay, here's another one. Uh, uh, why can't the Law Society make a radical change to the minimum terms? Um, if anybody has any suggestions for what they describe as a radical change, they can come up with it. But the, uh, the, the terms are tweaked, as I say, every year, but the basics were set as far back as 1994. And it's been the same essential protection for solicitors within the increasing level of cover over the years uh, since then. Uh, I can't uh, using the about 60,000, I think, was the original figure in 1994, and it's gone up over the years. But um, if anybody has a radical change they want to suggest, it will certainly be debated up here in Dungdale, as I say, for as long as four hours in an in insurance committee meeting. So here's kind of a, a bit of feedback then onto the previous question. So if there's limited risk uh, at that point, so this is, goes back to where changes made to the runoff cover to limit for six years. So if there's limited risk at that point, then surely it doesn't cost much for the insurers to maintain it. And brokers take a 20% commission. Well, it's just that in, in theory, something can come in a long time afterwards, and it's a question of access to people. Particularly if people have retired, um, you know, the, the claim comes in after six years, and then being able to go back to people uh, to see our records maintained, have been in a position to give evidence, it's a logistical claims management issue uh, from their perspective. So that's what would have driven them the first. Uh, there's a question there on the minimum terms. Do they apply to excess layers? Well, it, the clues in the name, the minimum terms are for the minimum cover. Uh, you can buy excess cover then, depending on uh, what levels you, you want to go up to. And obviously, the larger firms will buy more than the minimum cover. Uh, are we stuck with the renewal in December? No. And for years, it's been open to people to have different dates. Uh, but there's a very good reason why people all renew at the same time. Because if you're renewing, we'll say in February, uh, and you're trying to renew with your, your existing insurer, other insurers won't be focused on that market at that time. They're all focused on that the insurance the insurance market in December. They're not going to be focused on it in February, and you may not get alternative quotes. So you may then be a hostage to fortune and end up with a higher premium because you're stuck with your existing insurer at that stage. It's a competitive driven issue. Is what in practice leads people to try and move the same time. And just, just we're just coming to the end now, but I, I, maybe I'll ask you two questions at the one time, if uh, if you don't mind, because I think they're they're similar. So it's are the insurers colluding and ganging up on solicitors? Um, oh, if, if you were to ask anybody who's involved in dealing with them, you find a variation on a team coming in from, from them at, at different times. So they're not exchanging information. If anything, they're they're trying to be very uh, chaotic with their, their information, keep it to themselves. They don't share uh, information. So there's, there's no evidence of it. If anybody thinks. There is then by all means track down to the central bank and complain to the regulator. Uh, and then a question kind of leading on from that, but are there any ideas being developed by the, the, the committee on establishing a host business uh, to, for a number of sole practitioners to deal with uh, pro professional indemnity and all other regulatory and process issues, a model for a host business, so to speak? Uh, that sounds like bundling a load of practitioners into one host company, and but then yeah. the risk for each of them will be all of them will be kind of collaborating yeah, it's kind together. of a common management system. Yeah. Uh, that would fall across a number of committees. Uh, professional Dominion Insurance would be an important part of it, but that would fall into a number of them. But if anybody has any particular proposals, uh, we'd be delighted to hear them. Yeah, yeah, very good. And so then the Professional Indemnity Insurance Committee itself, it, it meets on a regular basis. It's open to submissions. And yeah, it, has it tends to meet more actively from kind of the spring on. Yeah. Uh, now there are issues which crop up uh, in, in terms of uh, practicing sorts, etc. Uh, in the beginning of the, the year, but the, the main focus is towards the latter half of the year. But it, it generally meets every couple of months. And I suppose then to just summarise what you you've given us a really good, uh, coherent, kind of uh, simplified version of what I need to do. But I need to fill out my common proposal form, and if I have any queries, there is a, a hotline phone number that I can call in the law side to get some additional help around that and to to shop around. Do you have anything else that you think you, we should add to that, Bill? Hmm, as Mr. Spock in, in general advice. Live long and prosper. 
Yeah, very good, very good. So thank you very much, Bill, for, for your time today. If anyone has one, one last question, we, we could probably take it. I think we've got a minute to go, but uh, I think it's been a really, uh, really informative show. Um, I think we've got to the heart of the matter very quickly and we've got a, a number of different answers. So we wish everyone the best of luck out there with uh, renewing their, their insurance. And uh, hopefully it doesn't work out at 20%. It'd be great to, great to see it come down. Uh, do you have any ideas around how we get it to come down, Bill? <laughs> no, as I say, just the, the, the more professional you look, the less of a risk you look, the more considered and prepared you look, that's going to help. Now, you're not going to break out of the sole practitioner bracket. You're not going to break out of the small firm bracket. But there, there are parameters within that. Um, but you can try and move the, the scale to be the more beneficial in it. Listen, Bill, thanks very much for your time today. I really appreciate it. I know you put in a lot of, a lot of work into doing that. And congratulations again on being made a, a senior counsel. I hope everyone will join me uh, next week for uh, uh, growing your practice and some ideas around planning for 2021, which hopefully will be a better year for us all uh, with uh, Claude O'Brien from Crow. Um, so thanks again to Bill for, for, for being a good sport today. So uh, we'll see you all next week. Slaw.